Hamilton in New York City. My name is Lisa Kerbiel. I head up the Joint SDG Fund at the United Nations. I'm really delighted today to welcome you to one of our first YouTube live events for the Joint SDG Fund featuring four incredible advocates for the Sustainable Development Goals. I'd like to start by introducing Jessica Gorski, Matthew Callahan, Vicky Aridi, and Hodan Osman. Um, and, and really give us an opportunity to meet each of these young people um, and all the amazing work that they're doing um, for, for the betterment of the world and, and all of our communities. Thanks so much for tuning in. We've got a, a record uh, attendee list today. So we're really excited. And I think we've got people tuning in from probably Nairobi and, and probably uh, elsewhere in the US. So really thrilled to see all of you. Um, we will be taking questions in the chat. So um, feel free um, as we're going along, um, we'll keep an eye on the questions in the chat to try to make this as interactive as we can. Um, so let, let's, um, let's start up with um, two uh, budding lawyers. We've got two uh, law students from St. John's University. Um, and Jess, we're gonna start off with you. Um, you've been studying green bonds, Jessica, um, during the majority of your time in law school. Um, could you just start us off for those who, who don't live in the world of green bonds, just telling us a little bit what they are and, and what they do? Sure. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm, as Lisa mentioned, I'm Jess. I'm a third year law student, so actually graduating in like a couple of weeks. Um, and I've been studying in this space for a couple of years now and just like fascinated by the growth of green bonds. And I know there's probably a varying level of familiarity with what they are. So I'll start from kind of the beginning of the story. Um, so essentially as part of the Paris Agreement, which has financing requirements, um, these sort of developed beginning, I guess earlier in around 2007 was when the first like climate-based bond originated. Um, and that was from a multinational development bank. And since then they've just exploded in popularity and have been found kind of in many different, um, many different sectors, many different types of issuers, many different countries and regions. So um, essentially, uh, my, my focus is on sovereign green bonds. So green bonds issued by countries um, and like national governments. So um, even though they're just one subset of this like broader topic. Um, so sovereigns have been issuing debt for hundreds of years. This is not, that's not a new, uh, that's not a new development. But what happened recently is that they're now issuing debt that's attached and raising funds for specifically green projects. So um, the bond essentially operates as an IOU. It's an issuer um, who will go to the capital markets and say, you know, we're selling these instruments um, and you can purchase them and we will use those proceeds towards green projects. Um, and they, Green is only the beginning because these also have kind of exploded to become a larger area called thematic bonds. Um, so there's green, there's sustainable, there's social, there's uh, sustainable linked, there's blue. So green is just one particular area. Um, and countries themselves who are issuing them get to decide what green eligible projects are. So um, if that's, um, building assets like wind farms, low carbon buildings or railways, or they can use that money towards subsidies and operation expenditures, um, such as excise taxes, exemptions for renewable energy. So there's so many different ways that they can use these funds. So that's, I hope that's like kind of a good way to lay this. No, it's excellent. No, it's excellent. I don't know um, what I what I find so interesting about our group, and I, I I guess we should have allowed you all to introduce yourselves a bit before we we jumped in. So that's my uh, my mistake. But you know, um, we have a, a former um, colleague from the Minister of Finance from Somalia, which is Hodan, um, who was watching so many issues on you know sort of unfold um, under under the new government that that came into. Um, that was elected several years ago. And, and Vicky is um, also based in Nairobi where um, you know, the mobile money in PESA allowed for the first uh, bond ever in the world to be floated over, um, over a mobile phone. So I do think bonds are so exciting. Maybe we'll just, um, if you'll forgive me, Jess, allow everybody to say a few words about who they are. And I'm so sorry, Let, let's start with that. So maybe Jess, 
why you're interested in bonds, why you're interested in being a lawyer, and let's go around and get to know each other first, and then we can go into the to the heavy lifting. So back to you, Jess. Yeah. Um, so I, I when I first told like friends at law school and people around me, I, this was like the space that I'm really passionate about. They were all like, what are you talking about? Um, and it's it's just like a new conversation that we're talking about with green finance. And these are one area where sovereign nations and countries and signatories to the Paris Agreement are able to meet their financing commitments. Um, because climate change all comes down, it mostly comes down to the money that can finance it and finance these projects. So, um, especially as I'm a student of public international law, I've taken a, almost every international law course that St. John's offers. Um, so this is sort of a, an interesting mechanism to look at international law and how it plays a role in climate change and financing climate change. Um, so just a little quick background on me. Awesome, awesome. Matt, over to you. Why, why do you wanna be a lawyer and, and why, why did you intern for the Joint SDG Fund? Yeah, thank you, Lisa. Um, uh, so as Lisa mentioned, I am a, a second year law student at St. John's. So um, I, really one of the big reasons I became a lawyer was just, I, I think it, your law degree is just power and, and, it, and it allows you to, to think in different ways. And there's so many different ways that you can use your degree. Um, and, and that's one of my, my uh, biggest motivations for going to law school. Um, in terms of working with the, the Joint SDG Fund and specifically the, the area that I focused on this semester, um, you know, I really was passionate about climate change and, and a lot of these challenges that we're facing as a, as a world right now, and in, in, in particular, how we're going to, how we're going to recorrect or correct the track that we're on. Um, and I think a lot of times when people look at things, they say, okay, well, what are governments going to do and what are, um, these big government organizations going to, going to do to, to facilitate that. But I, I was also really passionate about what the individuals and, and companies from it, from a perspective can do. Um, so that's kind of what led me to the private sector and, and how we can drive that change, whether that's a bottom-up approach or just individuals clamoring for change um, and, and how that can affect policy around the world. So that was kind of my motivation for, for working with the fund and in and, and law school in general. That's excellent. That's really motivational. Great. And Vicki, a recent law graduate, so already a lawyer based in Nairobi, who I had the pleasure of meeting. She's a she's a force of nature. Just recently voted. What, Vicky? Tell us tell us about some of your recent accolades, please. Thank you, Lisa, for that, and really great to reconnect. So, as you mentioned last week, I had the honor of being um, nominated as one of the 500 most inspiring youth in Africa and the top 60 within Africa. So that was great. <laughs> Thank you for that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. And maybe I could just give a brief about who I am. So my name is Vicky Aridi and I'm a young lawyer from Kenya. And really what drove me to study law is actually interesting because I started off in film school where I was actually filming and getting a sense of documenting community stories. But then something drove me to law, which was really, how can I be at the forefront of driving for sustainable change and really understanding why our policies are that way and what needs to change within the implementation of our policies for sustainable development. And that really drove me to study law. And funny enough, after studying law, then I found myself within the youth engagement space. And really because I believe that young people are dynamic. They have so much optimism. They have so much creativity and innovation. And that's why when we're talking about the 2030 agenda, we definitely cannot leave them behind. And really that's what has driven my work today to just continue to ensure that young people are given seats at the table, are given a place to own their voice and actually are meaningfully engaged. Thank you. That's awesome, Vicki. No, I mean, the, the beauty about a law degree, ironically, right, is that you can use it in so many ways, right? Um, and I think, you know, using the law now through that lens, um, it just amplifies your voice. So it, it's so exciting. I'm thrilled that I met you before you, you graduated, and now it's, it's really great to reconnect. So um, wonderful. Hodan. Hodan is our, our, our more senior youth person, if you will. Um, so not to, uh, not to put you in the same category with, um, with our young youth, but uh, more of an auntie maybe. Um, Hodan, tell us a little bit about yourself. I'm, I'm so thrilled you joined us. I'm thrilled that we met. 
when I had the honor to be working um, with UNICEF in Somalia. So give us a little background. Thanks. Yeah. Actually, before you said that, I was going to say, thanks for lumping in with young people. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> I'm just going to take it. <laughs> I love it. Um, yes, I, at least I met when I was working, working in Somalia. But before I did that, um, I used to be a commercial banker for about nine years or so before really switching over to the public sector. And I think it's when I went to my country in Somalia, right when the government was forming um, at the end of 2012 that I really developed this strong passion for, for public service and really like I just fell in love with public service and its potential and, and, and what it can do. Um, so that's when I kind of saw like the power of policy and, and what it can do in terms of opening up countries and, and um, in terms of facilitating for change. So since then, I've actually just become like a big advocate for government, <laughs> which isn't what people really want to hear when you're the private sector about markets and regulations. But but I definitely do see government as being like a really strong, you know, facilitating actor. Um, and I think it's like some of the things that I'm, I'm really interested in and always trying to uncover and understand. Um, and, and I think since leaving Somalia, my work in the government has actually now taken me more um, working with SMEs and then working in this investment space. Um, and that's been really great because I think what I bring to that usually is, is like I'm always having like my public sector policy hat on <laughs> um, in these environments uh, and then trying to bring that back to when I go back to the public sector. So I've really just really enjoyed um, you know, like like working um, on these issues and and, and I really love what you what the joint SDG fund is doing. And I can say a little bit more about that <laughs> um, during my time. But for me, it, it was just like wonderful to be part of the team. So thank you for having me. No, it's it's really, it's, um, I think the more I think about what the joint SDG fund can do, um, all of you actually have a role right now in the joint SDG fund from very different perspectives. And I think what's wonderful about being in a startup inside the United Nations is we have the mandate of the UN, which I, you know, believe in wholeheartedly, a thousand percent, the charter, human rights, equality, all the things we need in our world, right? The SDGs, but there's so many ways to unpack that. And, and the work is endless, right? Across so many countries in the world. And if this fund can be a catalyst to try to, you know, get some of those great ideas going, if we can, you know, seed some, some investments that take off and then, and then grow, um, that's really exciting. So Hodan, we'll come back to you a little bit about the work you're, you're going to maybe do for us, at least, and some of your reflections on that. But, but maybe now that we got to know each other a little bit, so, so apologies to the audience. We're getting great chats, so keep it coming. A lot of praise coming in from the fans out there in YouTube land. So thank you. So maybe um, we just were mentioning the power of government. So great segue back to, um, to Jess for a minute. Um, and Jess, you know, while you were taking the expertise you already had on green bonds in this space, um, there was a need that we saw coming out from Latin America and the Caribbean, right? So the Joint SDG Fund works globally. We have regional offices around the world and we try to work through what are called resident coordinators. Resident coordinators are the head of the United Nations country team in, in, in a country and they report up to Secretary General Gutierrez. So what, what Jess was doing is starting to engage a little bit with some of our colleagues um, in that region. Can you tell us a little bit about the trend, Jess, in that space, in that region, and, and what you think it might tell us for the fund, for our knowledge? Yeah, sure. And and I, I would say also, like, I had the immense privilege as an intern for the fund of speaking with and contacting people who were interested in this and who are working in this space already. Um, I got, I was lucky enough, I spoke with Climate Bonds Initiative, which is like the leading um, organization on on sustainable bonds right now. So um, was able to gain a lot of insight about like, you know, the growth of green bonds right now in um, the Latin America and the Caribbean region. So um, I think one big thing I noticed was that it's growing beyond green bonds. I know that's been like where I started and where my interest first arose, but it's, becoming uh, much more common for countries in Latin America and the Caribbean to be issuing the other types of thematic bonds. Um, so for example, Mexico just issued the first uh, sustainable development goals, uh, I guess, associated bond. Um, so the SDGs specifically, their funds are going towards fund like projects for uh, all 17 SDGs. Um, Ecuador was the first sovereign in the world to issue a social bond. 
um, with proceeds raised to go toward affordable housing. And it was issued in the international market and for 400 million, but it's set to mobilize $1.35 billion in investments. Um, and those bond, pro those bond proceeds are going to go toward providing mortgage loans at a preferential interest rate. So, and then another um, interesting development is that in Colombia, they're actually building out their regulatory framework to enable these um, issuances. So countries, and especially coming from the legal perspective, this is really interesting that like our securities laws, our regulations, they have to make room for these types of bonds and they have to start to respond to them. So um, Columbia actually issued a circular letter from its um, superintendency of finance and it, uh, or I guess financial superintendency and um, it's intended to actually recognize green bonds as a like a security instrument. And, um, and yeah, so that's just a couple of high level um, highlights I wanted to mention. Yeah, that's excellent, Jess. I mean, I, I love the the bond for affordable housing, like to, to imagine how, you know, mortgages in many parts of the world are just completely out of reach, right? The percentage, the, the interest rates are just extraordinary, not like in the US where, you know, at the moment, interest rates are so low, it's almost cost effective to take a loan, but in many parts of the world, not. So using a sovereign instrument to allow people to, to enter the home ownership um, ladder, if you will, to really get a, an entry point is fantastic. Um, really exciting. Um, I'm aware of the time, so um, let me let me loop over to to Matthew um, and a little pivot from from what governments are doing to maybe what the private sector is doing. So Matt, could you start maybe by a little bit of um, what your research has been uh, while you've been interning and and what you who you've talked to that sort of thing? Yeah, of course. So so a lot of my my research this semester was focused on, like I mentioned, the, the private sector and the role that they can play, um, and specifically how the interplay between governments and, and the private sector is really going to be key um, in in pursuit of twenty thirty. Um, so this semester, I really tried to to, to network and communicate with a lot of uh, lawyers that worked in that international space, specifically the climate and ESG space. Um, and it was kind of a unique perspective because, in many ways, they operate as the intermediary between. Governments, you know, the governments will impose regulations and, and lawyers have the responsibility of then commuting, communicating that on to their clients um, in terms of how they can comply, whether those are corporations or individual investors. Um, so that was kind of my 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 role this semester and really where I, where I spent a lot of my research. And, and I, I think it really showed that there, there's a huge opportunity for the interplay of governments and the private sector and how that, that can really be a, a, a contributing factor to 2030. So, so Matt, you were looking at the regulations that would impact a company who said they wanted to invest in the SDGs, right? Yes. And and you're basically trying to to look at how to guarantee that what they're investing in actually is an SDG investment, isn't it? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so a, a big problem, especially in the, for the private sector space, is kind of this concept of what we consider greenwashing in the sense that. Uh, it's investors are obviously key to engage in this this space, right? They, they want to be engaging in, in green areas, um, but with a lack of information surrounding the space, it's easy for companies or organizations or governments to label their products as quote unquote green or sustainable. Um, and so, what these dis various disclosure regulations or sustainable regulations do is they kind of put an objective metric into place, um, and they allow for investors and investors to have sort of a metric to kind of gauge whether um, uh, products and, and services are actually considered green. Uh, and so what it does is it provides the, the end investors with a more facilitated and, and universal description of what the, the process that they're involved in um, and a lot in turn allows them to make more informed um, and appropriate decisions and align their, their decisions with the SDGs. Excellent, excellent. And do you have any, I remember you were looking for what exists and we started to chat about how one of the roles of the UN is of course for normative change, right? We're always looking to set the standard in a new and emerging area, you know, take lessons learned, you know, just as learning lessons from how some countries have done it well. Can we share those elsewhere? Have you, have you seen any hope for, for what could become the, 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 the gold standard for compliance in this area? Yeah, so I think that that's been a, a, actually a very common problem is is as these various governments in around the world implement their their regulations, there becomes kind of a proliferation of of compliance measures that 
uh, companies have to uh, respond to. Um, and as you see that there's, you know, it, it, we operate in an interconnected world and companies are doing business all across the world. So the, the, the vast number of these kind of disclosure regulations can kind of incur a significant cost of compliance. Um, so I think the role for the UN in that sense is really being the common guide or, or as we kind of referred to it in the, internally in the fund is the North Star and using kind of the principles uh, outlined in the SDGs as that way forward. Um, so I, can, I, I really think that the, the world's gonna continue to implement these regulations, but if the UN can kind of operate as this is the baseline and this is the common objective that we want to achieve, um, there's gonna be room for varying level of dis, uh, regulations and, and space for them to implement those. That's excellent, yeah. Um, Matthew just quoted the Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed, who, uh, who called, the, in the midst of this horrible pandemic, in the midst of everything that COVID-19 ha has done to the world, she said, let's not lose sight of the North Star, which is the SDGs. So well done, Matt. That was, that was well noted. Um, excellent. No, so excited. I know your paper is going to be coming out. So please stand by, everyone who's listening. Both Jessica and Matthew will be publishing their work um, in an international law journal in the coming months. Um, so we will definitely have that up on our pages um, and be keen for them to share that with us through blogs and, and other systems. Um, so they think they're leaving their internship at the UN, but you never really leave the joint fund. You know, you, you never really leave. Um, but thank you so much, Matt. Great, great work and, um, and so much great thinking about how to really make this possible, right? I mean, the last thing we wanna do is make it too difficult for a company to do the right thing. But on the other hand, we don't want them claiming to be the right thing when in fact they, they might not be. So it's a very sensitive area, but, but it's an exciting one. Um, Vicki, we're going over to you. You are um, a youth advocate. You, you've been acknowledged and recognized as one. What, what Vicki, do you say is your greatest challenge in that role? What, what do you see for the, the engagement of young people around this huge, huge area of the SDGs? Thank you so much, Lisa, and thank you for having me. And congratulations to Jessica and Matt on your article. Please send the PDF. So when it comes to really the SDGs, there are quite a number of challenges for young people. And the first one really comes looking at COVID-19. So COVID-19, as you knew and you know, caused a shift and backtracked us on our way to achieving the SDGs. So really that was one big challenge. And really it's called, called for African youth and really youth across the globe for there to be a need for retooling of African youth. So that's really a pertinent challenge. How do we ensure that young people are now really retooled with the new skills and with the new knowledge to be able to still advance and accelerate progression towards the SDGs? Another pertinent challenge, especially for young people, comes with, with the idea of finances, because often than not, young people have great ideas. They have fantastic innovations, but how do we take it a step further? Often than not, young people don't have the skills or even the knowledge on how to write grant proposals on how to tap into those finances. So they often get left at the idea level, which is quite unfortunate. And then the third thing that, that also is a challenge for youth who are advocating in this space is mentorship. Because really, we can go far, but we can't go the farthest if we go alone. So really that hand to hold and really just to be guided that when you're navigating this space, these are some of the ways that you can really tap into. This is how you can grow your innovation. And really, that's, those are some of the key challenges that I can think of from the top of my head. Yeah, no, I, uh, I couldn't agree more, Vicky. I think, um, how do we make sure that the, the voices of those who will be inheriting the, the world that's, that's currently being discussed, debated, or ignored, right? The issues that are not being uh, taken seriously enough, that all, unfortunately, will be what the world that you all inherit, right? Um, so if the policies aren't put in place, if the green energy isn't installed, I mean, you know, we all, we've all seen the data. So um, really, really um, powerful. Um, would you, uh, Vicky, have any reflections on what you think might be some of the investments? I mean, we're, we're talking a bit about investments. We've talked a little bit about green bonds and then maybe the private sector, which could be the banks coming in uh, around that green bond. Now, maybe a little bit from where you are, and you know, you've got a lot of perspective on, on what you're seeing, how youth can be involved. 
are there investments that governments and the private sector, I mean, do you see hope in this space? Do you see a future SDG youth bond, you know, taking hold globally, et cetera? Thank you so much for that, Lisa. And really, it's very important for these investments to be put in place. And I look at investments in different perspectives. And the foundational investments I always think about when it comes to investments before we even go to the bonds or even the finances, the capacity building, is really the investments in understanding and embodying a culture and a practice of meaningful youth engagement. That's the first and foundational investment. Because if that investment is not in place, we can't even begin to talk about the bonds, the finances, because if we don't know how to engage youth, if we don't know how to put them within the structures right from the inspirational phase of our designing of programs to the implementation, then we will not develop sustainable and strategic investments. And then once that foundation is laid on, moving to the next level of investments, and this is actually something that people often forget, the investment of time. So really time is a strategic investment and time comes in a number of folds really. First, investing the time as I mentioned in mentorship because even if we need to bring young people on board, we need to take our time to really mentor them and give them those skills and really bolster their knowledge. And then after that really now investing in capacity building and really hubs where young people can be able to sharpen their skills and really be having those relevant skills that can implement the SDGs. And then now we move on to the next level because you're really thinking of how are we shaping and skilling these young people to, to be really part of this movement. And then after that is really seeing now, how can we start thinking about one, grants? How can we think about, as you mentioned, an SDG youth bond, which is really focused on ensuring that young people are able to tap into that bond, even for investments, and even for different projects that touch on the different SDGs. And then also now thinking about research, because in this SDG space, investing in young people's research with respect to the SDGs will go a long way. Just as Jessica and Matt have mentioned rightfully on this call, they were exploring different areas, Jessica on green bonds and Matthew on the private sector. And just because of how instrumental their research is and that paper that will be published, it could go a long way really in terms of advancing the 2030 agenda. And then last I would think about is investments in mental health. This is something that is not discussed often, but if you don't invest in young people's mental health, then you won't have those great innovations. You won't have the people to tap into the SDG youth bond. So really thinking about those things very progressively. Yeah. Yeah, Vicky, you, you remind me of, of so many of the things when I was with uh, UNICEF in, in Nairobi um, that we tried to really bring to the fore. Um, I love your idea of having more, having a window or a, a space for research on the SDGs and moving them forward. And I know that Liz has built um, a youth corner, which I know you've been a part of Vicky already, right? Trying to get conversations going. And but why couldn't we use the um, the groundbreaking work of, of Jess and Matt and there's other um, interns, uh, Yalda and others who've done great work for us? Why can't we open up a space where? other students who want to share their SDG research, they can have it posted on our pages. They can, because it could just lead to more conversations like this. And obviously, you know, um, papers written in New York are different than papers written in Nairobi, just by the context in which you're sort of surrounded and the perspective, it could be so enriching. So I think that's a great idea. The SDG youth bond has to be done. So I think we should just all right now raise our hands and say, let's, let's find a way. Um, and mental health, absolutely. I mean, if, if COVID hasn't reminded us about isolation and vulnerability, then nothing can, right? I mean, um, there's physical isolation and then there's the one that, that regardless of a, of a pandemic is there, right? For so many reasons. And I think it is underserved. It is underserved by the UN and it's something that um, in Somalia as well, um, there were champions looking at mental health and PTSD and trying to really get services for, for so many people who, who've been through so much. So, so well, well noted. Um, excellent. Okay, so we're moving on to Hodan, not as a, as sort of as our, our home run, right? Um, Hodan has been in so many of these spaces, right? She, she's, you know, 
once upon a time been that budding student. She's also been um, successful as a professor. She has worked inside government for the private sector. She might even be consulting now with the Joint SDG Fund. Um, hold on, um, what do you make of this conversation? I mean, you, you have such a great um, perspective uh, given all that you've done in your, in your few, few years. Um, yeah, the floor is yours. Take it, take it anywhere you'd like. Thank you. First of all, I always want Lisa to introduce me wherever I go. <laughs> that they could have taken that along with me. Um, and second, um, I think like I really just enjoyed listening to all the points that were being raised. And I think especially with 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 the youth and, and what Vicky was just raising around skills and you know building skills and capacities and these things. And I think like it, it always occurred to me that like we have been in the past kind of focused on these types of interventions, although we're not doing enough of them, like we are focused on these types of like targeted interventions of trying to, um, you know, build up skills of the youth, trying to, you know, match with employers, trying to do all of these things. And I think the the missing side of it, though, is that if unemployment is, is a chronic issue, uh, it, it means it needs more structural solutions. So we could be targeted and do these things, but actually because this is chronic, we need more structural solutions. And the reason I'm saying that it needs to be structural is that if you look at it, especially in developing countries, 90% of youth are actually sitting in development countries. And we're expecting about a billion young people to be coming into the workforce um, or trying to actually get employed in the next decade. But, but within developing countries, half of them are not gonna be employed properly. They're either gonna be underemployed or they're going to be like not employed and I think and I think this is uh because of this it's not about trying to you know yes I think it's really important to build up skills and try to match them but it's but that's shifting things within the pie like we really need to look at is like how do we actually make this pie bigger and I think this is where capital comes in and, and what we're trying to do because if you look at um labor and capital, what we're having here is a massive mismatch between capital and labor. There's inadequate labor in developing countries, and but an access of available labor. And this is the issue that we're trying to face. So we need to actually raise, to be able to raise capital. And I'm just thinking to what Lisa said just earlier on our call about interest rates being low. So in the developed world, like what you have is interest rates are low. So it's actually much cheaper to access capital than it is labor. Labor is expensive. So it's not a coincidence that a lot of the technology that's being worked on is about how do we actually rely less on labor? All of these manufacturing, all of this AI coming in because labor is actually more expensive than capital in developed countries. So, so here, what we have in developing countries is this mismatch of inadequate capital and also like and a high abundance of available labor. So, so this is why I think what SDG fund is doing in terms of raising capital is incredibly critical. And then we could take it a step further to try and understand, okay, well, where are these youth then going to be involved? Like, even if we are kind of to like, you know, make this pie bigger. And I think this is where SMEs really come in. If you look at it, the majority of people um, work for SMEs. So what are we doing among SMEs? And, and I think this is where UN can be unique and catalytic because UN is able to take more risk. If you look at other um, agencies that do work, like a lot of things are, 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 are very much focused on these much bigger, you know, corporations and organization. And I can understand because trying to actually do something about SDGs is high touch, high volume, really hard to work on, but it is an incredible space. And I take one of the projects under the SDG funds as an example, um, the Malawi fund, and I, which I think is just incredible. Um, and what they're doing in the Malawi fund is actually putting a fund together that is actually able to inject capital that are able to fund these SMEs that would come up that are mainly focused on agriculture, which is a labor intensive area. So, so, I think, so I think what we really need to be looking at is trying to understand how do we increase capital you know, inflows coming in, look at the spaces that youth are actually getting hired in the most, or people are getting hired in most, which is SMEs, and then figure out how do you actually get more capital into it so we can grow that pie. And then by that time, hopefully then we have enough skilled youth to then be able to like match this. And I think the final thing I'd like to say on this topic, and I think this is something that that Vicky um, raised as well, um, is, is in terms of, um, you know, like this, the mental health issue and all of these things. Imagine if we have 1 billion youth coming in and, and half of them are not going to be employed. Like, these are all of these youth that are that are standing around and, and not having much to do. And when you look at the narrative that's out there, the narrative is always focused on things like, um, you know, they try to securitize this problem <laughs> by talking about like instability and like distress and all this thing. But 
but putting the secretization aside, I mean, like we care about our young people. Like this is like, you know, all these young people that are not gonna be able to have the skills, um, the, the work experience over time to then actually be able to contribute to society. I mean, like to, to the bigger global economy. So what we're doing actually is such a disadvantage because they can't catch up. You know, so, so that's what happens. So putting aside the social sectorization, so all of these things, it's like we're not going to be able to catch up properly if we can't, if we're not able to like employ our youth, you know, properly. And this is where I see like what SDG fund is able to actually come to do by in addition to the very targeted interventions that we just talked about, about the youth bond or skills. There's also us looking at how do we actually inject more capital into this market, but inject capital in such a way that actually promotes employment. I think that's where SMEs come in. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I, it reminds me of visiting, um, there's an innovation hub at the University of Nairobi. There's a few of them um, across Kenya and, um, you know, young people, you know, coming up with, you know, things made out of recycled materials and I mean, you name it, it was, it was happening and it wasn't happening, you know, with the largesse of, of a developed lab. It was happening, you know, with what they had. And, um, you know, there's this term Juakali, you know, you just, you just make it happen. And they were doing that, but then they were doing it to a level that it was a life-saving mechanism. Um, you know, one in particular was for women who might hemorrhage during childbirth because the medicine that can stop blood flow might not be in the clinic when it's needed. And so they developed this, essentially a way to wrap the woman tightly to to suppress her her blood loss. Um, incredible things, incredible things. How do we get you know venture capitalists to know about you know this incredible tool that exists right there in Nairobi? It's it I, I can I can see where it is in the lab. How do we connect the two? And that becomes a small and medium enterprise, right? Because then that that patent protects that creative young person, and they can create a, a small business around that. I do think there's something there. I do think the, the legislative and policy framework you need to protect the, the innovative young person still isn't there. So I always, I always get nervous because I'm fearful of, of people coming in and, and not being protected when they've done all this amazing work. But I, but I hear you, Hodan. I, I really hear you. And um, you know, I, I've had the honor to, to work with some of those young people as well. Um, how do we make sure we don't miss that opportunity? And you're so right, looking further ahead you know, if you if they're underutilized now, they're not going to magically become you know utilized in 20 years. So if we're talking about contributing, if we're talking about paying back, if we're talking about them being the next generation of parents to give to their children, um, you know that that really isn't setting the foundation that we need. Um, hold on, maybe just because you also have this incredible. I know you recently published um, some work on on the investment space in in particular kinds of countries. I wonder if you could just tell us a bit about what you're seeing from all of that work. And I think that's more of the, the development bank side of things, which to me is fascinating. Um, many people may not know that there's a whole, there's a whole community of development banks and, and maybe just a few words on, on that space. That, that, that are trying to do this. And I, and I think um, Matthew touched on this a little earlier as well when he was talking about just like this trend and everybody just wanting to get into this like impact investment space. And I liked what Matthew said about like, well, they don't really know if it's green. So they're calling it green. <laughs> so we're not sure. And I, and I think that's really evident because I think if you look at the numbers, I think they're estimating either, you know, um, there's either seven over $700 billion that are going into like impact investing now or over 2 trillion, but we don't know because people are like, you know, kind of labeling things some way or, or another um, just to kind of, you know, make it seem that it has impact so 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 it's unsure so i thought it was like really interesting for matthew to kind of raise that uh, but nevertheless i think this 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 really just goes to show like how much um people are willing to invest for impact and how much this is going on and, and some of the work that i've been doing with development financial institutions and most recently for the joint sdg fund have been meeting with them so there is a whole lot of um interest in doing this so so when i look at what UN's role could potentially be, because if we look at this two trillion space or whatever it may call, you have private equity in there, you have venture capitalists, you, you've got the developed financial institutions, philanthropists, like all of these people that are coming in. But I think where, where the UN has kind of a unique advantage is that they are able to actually, first, they have a very clear um, impact driven mandate. So this, so this risk return relationship is, is very different for the UN. So I think that's like, you know, a huge differentiator. And I think second, I think the UN is able to actually take um, a lot more risk 
um, th than these institutions can. So in that way, the UN is actually able to play this catalytic role um, for that reason. And I think that's that's where um, the impact can then happen. So with, with the discussions that I've had already with DFIs and talks, I mean, you've got, D I mean, DFIs develop financial institutions. You've got IFC, that's a DFI, as well as the smaller European DFIs as well. But then you have, you know, an organization just as, such as the IFC and it's investing in hotels, you know, that's great, but it's not exactly like the bottom of the pyramid that we're looking for. So this tells me that as much as there is a massive interest into getting into the space and working on SDGs, we're still trying to figure this out. I mean, I've had a conversation with CDC, which is the, the, the big development financial institution for the UK, and they invest an average of like 20 million or so in a project. So they invest in like really large projects. Um, so to other DFIs, but a lot of the criticism that's been coming now is that, you know, since COVID and everything, it's, it's really has shown how, how much DFIs are actually not taking even a greater risk to go even further um, into whether it's fragile countries or, or whether into these states. So they're actually being pushed right now to do more, but, but it's a space that we all still haven't really figured it out you know figured it out yet and i think with with um with un with the joint sdg fund with the un what i love about it actually is that and i think i told elaine this who, who's my colleague on this is that you know what every time i think i know what it is <laughs> you peel another layer i'm like oh, okay it's not that it's this <laughs> so, so i really do like the complexity and i think the one thing that i picked up on or my eureka moment is like oh my god this is more of a of an instrument than an actual fund you know, and, and I think it being an instrument, I think that's where the big value is. Because once you're an instrument, then you're able to actually convene actors, you know, around investment, you're able to be catalytic, you're able to take that risk, you're able to show, show proof of concept, and you're able to engage in things like capacity building and, and technical development, which, which, which a typical investment firm may not be able to do that. So if I go back to what I said earlier about this kind of risk reward relationship and such, and I think what happens normally is that a lot of these investments look at the cost of, of this kind of like risk return. Um, and, and yes, it's really high. And part of it is, is the perception of risk around developing countries that is driving that. You know, we have very little access to capital markets and whether it's, you know, real risk or perceived risk, whatever it is, it's really high. So, so interest rates are high. People are not willing to put capital into there. So it does take, you know, innovative projects such as these to kind of show um, countries or areas that normally wouldn't get investment and to, and to leave that capacity there. Um, and I know I said a lot on this, but one thing, another thing that really did come up for me as well in this is context, just how much it's really context driven. So, so it's not this top down, this is the standard, you know, blended financial instruments that we're pushing down to everyone, but it really is context driven. Like it's, it's done from the bottom up. There's local banks involved in it, which getting local banks into the space. And the, the reason why it matters for it to be context driven, for it to come up and to have domestic capital in that way is because the risk reward relationship is very different when it's domestic capital versus foreign capital. If it's foreign capital, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not willing to look at the impact as much, but for domestic capital, I do care a lot more, like whether it's local banks or governments. And the reason we care is who cares about the education of Kenyan children more than Kenyans? You know, who cares about the education of Malawi children more than people in Malawi? So for that reason, when I'm actually looking at the risk reward relationship, I put it a lot higher and I'm able to actually do more for impact because I care about this a lot more because it is domestic. And like maybe a private equity firm that's sitting in New York that has to be convinced <laughs> of these things. So, so, so to kind of like sum up, because like I said, I've said so many things I love about this, um, is that the fact that it's context driven, you know, the, the fact that it's bringing in like local capital, like in that way, the fact that it's able to take, you know, risk um, a lot more than others, that in that way, it can be catalytic and create a pipeline for bigger um, agencies or bigger development financials to come into an already kind of like proven, you know, projects that are um, viable. Um, and, and, and finally, I, I, think, I think more than just that, I think I think it could also serve as a model for UN as a whole. The UN is already spending so much money, whether it's in humanitarian space or in development spaces, so much money in aid. And I think if this model, the startup <laughs> can be proven to show that it works, I think we can now start thinking about, okay, well, now that we figured out a way to invest for SDGs in a, in a meaningful way, we have proven concepts, we have these examples, we've done these experiments, how do we now tack that on to much larger UN programs that can take that on and do more of that instead of the traditional kind of like aid facilities that's there. 
Um, so yeah, I, I hope that covered it, but, but, there, but, but there is a lot to be excited about. You know, I, I mean, I really find it fascinating how COVID in some ways has forced new conversations, but does not guarantee that, that new risks will be taken. And I think that's, I mean, we're seeing that um, in, in many different ways as a, as a instrument of the UN that relies on government support, right? We are funded by member states of the United Nations. Without those public monies, it's very difficult to go in front of private investors to ask to blend. Um, and we are very reliant on their leadership. So it's really, it's really a, um, a time to, you know, to let that North Star come back into, into our skies, so to speak, and, and see where we're going. I think that the youth employment and the underutilization of youth, um, you know, there's a thing called Generation Unlimited, which the Secretary General launched um, a few years ago, which is really trying to echo what you were saying, you know, a billion youth coming online you know, coming out into the workforce, where will they go? Who will catch them? Um, and, you know, the five of us are privileged in one way or the other that we were educated and we were employed. Um, and in a way, um, how do we make sure that we just open that, that door um, so, so wide? Um, and I love, it's interesting, I mean, hotels. So you think to yourself, well, great, hotels are great employers. There's, there's a window, right? You could imagine that being, you know, aligned with a university that does, I mean, my husband went to Utali, which was the, the big hub for tourism in Kenya um, for many, many years. There were, there were young people coming from all of Africa to Utali in Nairobi to become, you know, sort of the, the gold star standard for, um, for service, for the service industry. So um, unfortunately that's, that's no longer the case, right? You, you've got a pandemic, you've got industries completely decimated by lack of tourism, lack of travel, security at times does play a role. So you've got um, different factors that limit that. So how do we make sure we also diversify the training we provide to young people? We're about to launch a call on the small island developing states as a, as a fund. Um, and these are the 38 countries that are basically, you know, impacted not only by climate change, but by their geography. So by nature of their, where they're located and their, their limited populations, it's difficult for them to get investments because you know, they may only have a million people. And so they may not be able to show that they have a market share, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the main messages coming through is youth, technical, vocational, educational training. What are we gonna do with these youth? And you, know, you wonder to yourself, you know, we can create some new industries, but it's, it's tricky. It's like being a landlocked country. I mean, there's, there's challenges for so many parts of the world, but we, it does remind me how much opportunity there was um, in Nairobi and how we really shouldn't lose track of, of, of being innovative, right? I mean, Hodan knows we were trying to look at the impact of diaspora. Like, how do we connect all the incredible Somalis that are around the world doing amazing things? And how do we make a matching program, right? This is the work of IOM. There's a lot of parts of the UN trying to do that, bring those experts home. I mean, Hodan, you know, was one of those examples who came back and was in the Ministry of Finance. How do we, how do we do that? How do we look at innovation and investment? So I would love to um, get everyone on this call, sort of, um, you know, plan a huddle around this idea, right? How, how, and what would it take to launch um, a bond for youth employment? What would it take to do that? And who would be interested? And how do we make sure that there is a local context because you know that could be I mean Vicky you probably never heard the story of M. Watoto, but I mean there's an amazing capital markets association in Nairobi um, and there's some very powerful national and international banks based in Kenya um, so how do we really tap into that um, when you have the power of M-Pesa which is a you know a powerful force now across several countries if not if not most of of eastern Africa so I do think that there's there's power there. Um, so I think lots of opportunities. Go ahead, Hodan. I'm just gonna add with Lisa, and I think what it comes down to is like being able to take that risk to experiment and be innovative. And I think this is where larger organizations are kind of like held back because they can't. And I think this is why then if the UN is able to take risk, I think we owe it to actually like really experiment <laughs> and really and, and take that risk for innovation because then what happens is that if you are able to do it, and it is context driven and local, you do it once, then it's picked up. Like right now, like who would buy a bond from Malawi? Not a lot of people, but, right. but, but if we're able to actually prove that it works and we make right. it and it's there, then UN steps up because then the, it's been proving the market. Like the market steps in. Now the third, fourth time a bond is issued in Malawi, 
it's going to have a market. You know, so so it really is about trying to go that extra mile and be incredibly, you know, yeah. innovative because we can take that risk that right. others can't necessarily. Right. right. Well, I think, you know, traditional aid, um, you know, through the decades, you know, is showing us all of its limitations, right? And as you said, Hodan, you know, so much money um, and yet so much need. Um, so it doesn't always hit the mark. It doesn't always um, work fast enough or well enough. So the great thing about listening to the Deputy Secretary General talk about this fund is she always says, make the impossible possible. Go, go, go. And she's so eloquent she's so inspiring and i think the team that sort of backstops this fund um including you know great law students who give us their precious time and, and great you know experts like you hodan and vicky great advocates you're really um you exemplify how we're trying to do that each in your own way right each in a small sliver of it but i really do believe we'll we will keep trying and um you know you won't be able to blame us for not giving it our all and I think that's that's really the success of of, um, of our work. Um, we have to make it matter. We just have to reach everyone. So I want to thank you all. Any any final words? Any final? Um, we can we can do a shout out or any any other final words before we close. Happy to have your voices one more time. Jess, do you want to? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I did. I did have a final shout out that I didn't mention, which was just that the fund is already working with the green bond. Um, in Indonesia. So I, I wish I had said that when I was speaking earlier and um, kind of highlighted that because this is work that, I mean, the fund's doing amazing work and it's already in this space. So um, awesome. mention that. That's right. Yeah. Please go to our www.jointstgfund.org. You'll, you'll see all the good information about Malawi that Hodan mentioned also Indonesia. Yeah. Matt, any, any final reflections or thoughts? Yeah, no, I, I really, I really appreciate this conversation. I think you know a lot of it has to do with with having these conversations and starting out here and really kind of changing the narrative and and how do how do we address these problems from from a systematic approach? So I think that these, you know, these conversations as, as we can kind of come together and bounce ideas off each other and really then take them and implement in the field. That's that's the biggest the biggest thing we should take from this. And, and I and I'm really thankful we had the time to talk. Awesome, awesome, man. Thanks, Vicky. Over to you. Uh, I think I'd just like to say thank you for this inspiring and really fruitful discussion. And since I'm a youth advocate, I cannot end the conversation without going back to the youth. But really just saying that for young people, always take action for the SDGs. And for all of us, let's put our investments in young people. Let's catalyze investments for young people. And let's ensure that they're systematic and strategic and sustainable. Thank you. Awesome, Vicky. Awesome. Okay, and hold on. Great. No, that's just thank you so much for having me. It's such awesome. a great conversation. Awesome. And it's worth definitely. being more. Thank you. No, definitely. Yeah, no. So thanks, everybody. Really, all the great work, all the great commitment, um, your passion and your energy. And uh, it's a great way to start, start the day here in New York. So thank you again so much. Thanks for everyone who joined us. A lot of uh, very positiveness in the chat. So thanks for that. And um, yeah, everybody stay well, stay healthy and um, see, you, see you next time. Thanks.